Hey Internet, this is Jacob Clifford and welcome to Econ Movies, the only series on YouTube that's dedicated to overanalyzing movies in a desperate attempt to get views. Anyways, today's episode is The Terminator. Now, if you haven't seen the first two Terminator movies in a long time, here's the 30-second summary. Sarah Connor is a young, innocent woman living in LA when she learns that someone's killing women of her same name. But right before she's killed, she's saved by Reese, who explains he was sent from the future to protect her from the Terminator. Now, Reese tells Sarah that in the future, computers take over the world and that her unborn son, John Connor, will help the humans fight back. So the Terminator was sent back in time to kill Sarah before John was born. In the end of the first film, Reese is killed, the Terminator is destroyed, and now a pregnant Sarah with Reese's baby starts preparing for the eventual war with the machines. But it's not over. I'll be back. In the second film, John is a teenager, Sarah is in a mental hospital, and again, the Terminator is sent back. But this time, Arnold is the good guy to protect John and Sarah from a more advanced bad guy, Terminator. They fight, and the good Terminator wins, but it must be destroyed to prevent people from using the advanced technology to create computers that will start the war. So in the end, there's hope for the future and the survival of the human race. The unknown future rolls toward us. Let's go back to one of the best scenes in the second movie, when the good Terminator goes back in time and he enters a bar. Now he's completely naked and he's walking around scanning everything, looking for clothes that can fit him. After scanning everybody, he finally finds someone about his same size and he makes that guy an offer. I need your clothes, your boots, and your motorcycle. <laughs> now this idea of collecting data and scanning everything is not just something Terminators do. Economists argue that you do this all the time. For example, when you go to the store, you're constantly scanning. You're calculating your marginal utility, analyzing products and prices, and weighing the benefits and costs of your decisions. But the big difference between you and the Terminator is how you complete that transaction. This is an example of involuntary exchange, when someone's forced, usually through violence or the threat of violence, to give something to somebody else. Obviously, transactions like this are bad for the economy, right? If you steal something from someone, then somebody else is just gonna steal it from you, and there'd be no incentive to start a business, and life would be miserable. I mean, we'd all be worse off. So to avoid all this misery, we have a different system, and it's the social contract theory, right? Although it's in my own self-interest to threaten and steal, it's in our collective interest to respect property rights and the law. So to make society and the economy work, we promise not to use force. I swear I will not kill anyone. So we all agree that coercion and theft is wrong, but there's still one entity that doesn't follow this rule. It can and does take away private property by force. Now who is it? The government. Let's do a quick thought experiment. Obviously it's bad and wrong if one person steals a motorcycle from another person, but what if it's a group of nine people? Is that still wrong? Is that still theft? Well, sure, but what if it's a group of a hundred people? Is that still theft? Yes, but what if it's a group of a hundred people and the majority agree to take away your motorcycle and give it to a poor person that really needs it? Is that theft? What if it's a million people and the majority agree that it's in everyone's interest to take your bike or your private property, your money, and give it to some other person? I mean, at what point does taking private property switch from being theft to being a legitimate role of government? In other words, how many people have to agree to take away your private property before it's not considered theft? Say, that's a nice bike. But if the government couldn't use force to take your money, then no one would pay their taxes, and the government couldn't provide public goods and promote the public health, safety, or morals, or what political scientists call police power. These are things like requiring helmets when you ride a motorcycle, or having a waiting period when you buy a gun, or banning nudity on TV. Right? Each one is debatable, but instead, let's focus on how much the government should get involved in the economy. The economic spectrum is made up of state socialism on the far left, and neoliberalism on the far right. Socialists believe that involuntarily taking that motorcycle isn't theft if it meets a more important collective goal, like helping the needy. In fact, the greater crime would be allowing people to hoard goods and resources while other people suffer in poverty. So basically, socialists take that social contract theory one step further, right? It's in our collective interest not only to have the government promote peace, but also to bring everyone together and to achieve wider societal goals like fairness and equality. And if that requires higher taxes, or taking private property, then so be it. Hardcore socialists see all free markets as dangerous, right? Markets they claim to be friendly. Trust me. But really, they're mindless profit-seeking machines that are willing to exploit workers, the poor, and the environment. So socialists believe that markets need to be controlled or crushed 
because they only focus on money and getting rich, right? They're incapable of achieving or even appreciating our collective goals. Now, the other side of the spectrum is neoliberalism, which promotes private, unregulated markets. Neoliberals basically believe that the government has two jobs. Number one, to provide national defense, and number two, to enforce laws and contracts. And they shouldn't get involved in redistributing income or provide for the poor, and that seems pretty heartless. It doesn't feel pity or remorse or fear. But neoliberals claim that since people are paying fewer taxes, private charities will help the disadvantaged and self-interest and competition will protect the masses. I don't understand. The free market relies on voluntary exchange, on consent, right? A business can't force you to buy their product. In fact, the only way they can get you to buy something and make themselves better off is by making a good or service that makes you better off, that you're willing to buy. So if a producer creates an inferior product or charges unreasonable prices or treats our employees like crud or ruins the environment, the buyers can choose not to buy. So the real power in a free market is in the hands of consumers. You have to do what I say, huh? That's one of my mission parameters. The neoliberal economist Milton Friedman spent his entire career trying to explain these ideas and convince people that free markets are nothing to be afraid of. They might seem heartless and dispassionate, but they're better than the alternative. My mission is to protect you. Friedman and others argued against state socialism where the government is hooked into everything, trusted to run it all. He admitted that politicians have really good intentions but their policies almost always make the problem worse. For example, taking too much money from the rich and giving it to the poor is not only theft, it might create a disincentive for the poor person to work or get an education, leaving them in poverty and dependent on the government. Friedman also argued that regulating free markets would not only mean fewer jobs, but it would result in a bloated government bureaucracy and crony capitalism, where the government, rather than consumers, choose which businesses succeed and which ones fail. Put simply, Friedman believed that government's influence should be limited and markets should be privatized whenever possible. Hasta la vista, baby. So how much should the government get involved in the economy? Well, here's what Arnold thinks. That when the government stepped back and let the free enterprise system do its work, then the better we did, the more robust our economy grew, the better I did, and the better my business grew, and the more I was able to hire and help others. But most people are somewhere in the middle of the economic spectrum. In fact, almost every country in the world today has a mixed economy with both unregulated and regulated markets and some private and some public ownership of industry. So free markets and government are kind of frenemies, right? We force them to work together. Now, I live in the US and there's a heated debate regarding healthcare and taxes and education. And in every case, we have to ask ourselves, what is the role of the government in making our lives better off? Is it best if they take over, step back, or something in the middle? Knowing where you stand on the economic spectrum is important. These policies, they're gonna affect millions of people. So let me know in the comments below. And remember, as voters and consumers, we determine the future of the economy. The future is not set. There is no fate but what we make for ourselves. Hey, seriously, thank you so much for watching this video. Please subscribe and click on that notification bell so you can see when I make new videos. Also, check out some of my other videos. And of course, leave a comment. Tell me, was Friedman right? Was he wrong? Where do you stand, okay? Thanks for watching. Until next time.